In 1834, an angry mob descended on a church, intent on breaking up a gathering that included Lewis and Arthur Tappan. The Tappans were American capitalists. In the 1830s, they owned a successful and prominent New York mercantile import business. But their deep interest in slavery almost ruined them. When the mob came for them, they fled. The crowd then went into Lewis Tappan's home and threw his belongings into a fire on the street. What was it that had the crowd in such a fury? Well, the Tappan brothers, the epitome of American capitalism and entrepreneurship, were deeply interested in slavery because they were determined to bring it to an end. As Philip Magnus describes in the 1619 project, A Critique, the Tappans were prominent abolitionists and for their trouble became a target for pro-slavery forces determined to bring them to their knees. The Tappans were not alone among American capitalists in their determination to end slavery. Defenders of laissez-faire commerce and free trade included champions of freedom. It was a natural philosophical fit. But these are not the kinds of stories that you will hear in the 1619 Project, which has a different agenda than telling the truth. Capitalism is one of those things that like, we breathe in the air in this country. But I don't feel like most of us actually know what capitalism means. Maybe they are just confused. After all, we live in a time of political upheaval. In our present day, free market capitalism is in retreat. Big business, once thought to be champions of free markets and social prosperity, have colluded with government forces to create an economy dominated not by capitalism, but by corporatism. Corporatism is not capitalism. In America, commercial relationships are not solely determined by market forces. Far from it. Instead, AIER Samuel Gregg explains, in its place is a rapidly accelerating partnership of technocratic government and powerful corporate elites that control an ever greater proportion of economic activity. Corporatism is an economic and political system in which commerce is not driven by open competition. Instead, private property and competition are integrated into legal structures that enable governments to coordinate the activities of businesses, unions, and other organizations towards the realization of political and social objectives. This enables governments to favor, protect, subsidize, and benefit the business interests with which they're acting in concert. No wonder Nicole Hannah-Jones, the architect of the 1619 Project, is confused. America prides itself on being an exceptionally free and prosperous nation built on individual liberty and a brand of capitalism that we are taught makes the American economic system the greatest in the world. But the truth is, we live in a country rife with inequality, one defined as much by its poverty as by its prosperity. In the last few years, the pandemic made that harsh reality glaringly clear. But wait. Let's back up a little. The 1619 Project is not entirely wrong about the problems in this country. America is the most successful, wealthiest, most enterprising country in history. But its prosperity is no longer assured. Many people are having a tough time. People can no longer assume that they will be better off in the future than they or their parents were in the past. Power and economic might are concentrated in a few hands. Its institutions seem corrupted and in decline. It used to be that America was the land of opportunity. Hard work and a little ingenuity were enough to take you places. That's the beauty of capitalism. Nobody controls it. When demand and supply rule, nobody else does. Free markets protect everybody because it prevents anybody from taking control. No one can fix prices, limit supply, dictate the terms of employment, or restrict competition. True capitalism means freedom and opportunity for everyone. So what's happened to America? Put simply, we are giving up on capitalism. Big corporations have become entangled in the arms of big government. There's favoritism, gatekeeping, revolving doors, pork barreling, and all kinds of funny business. 
During its conquest of America over the past few decades, and most intensely in the past few years, the corporatist partnership of big business and big government have persuaded the population into believing that the cause of their misfortune is an economic system, capitalism, that largely no longer exists, and into believing that its friends are its enemies and its enemies are its friends. The ground is shifting beneath our feet. America is now governed by propaganda, surveillance, censorship, ideological conformity, coordination. It's not just big business and big government who have combined to become a corporatist aristocracy. Other powerful institutions who once served as checks and balances on each other have signed on board. Union leadership jealously protect their power and status and work with corporations to mandate medical interventions on their members. Those once hostile to the very idea of multinational pharmaceutical companies now seek their embrace. Universities, once champions of free and open inquiry, are the most extreme of ideological institutions. We recognize inequities built by past and present traumas rooted in white supremacy, colonialism, the gender binary, ableism, and all forms of oppression. Big Tech takes marching orders from big government to censor and suppress speech on social media. The establishment media, once known as the fourth estate for not belonging to any established class or group in society, now supports and promotes the only game in town. Institutions once dedicated to protecting the downtrodden, the poor, the persecuted, and the powerless now act in concert to further their own interests and keep the masses under their thumb. These are the kinds of things you would expect to find in a corporatist regime, even if it's only soft corporatism. Sam Gregg explains, whatever the form, corporatism creates serious political and economic problems. And what kind of a political ideology is corporatism? The most notorious corporatist regimes were the fascist ones, like Mussolini's Italy. As Hayek eloquently described in The Road to Serfdom, everyone who has watched the growth of these movements in Italy or in Germany has been struck by the number of leading men from Mussolini downward who began as socialists and ended as fascists or Nazis. Few are ready to recognize that the rise of fascism and Nazism was not a reaction against the socialist trends of the preceding period, but a necessary outcome of those tendencies. Nicole Hannah-Jones commits the same fundamental error as so many others. Capitalism is designed to exploit labor and human beings. Mm -hmm but all people are not exploited equally. She says that capitalism is a systematic tool of oppression, when it is actually the illiberal regimes on both the left and the right, past and present, like socialism, Marxism, fascism, and corporatism, that are cut from the same cloth. We have the ability to collaboratively build a more peaceful, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable world. Samuel Gregg points out how Klaus Schwab's so-called stakeholder capitalism, which is supported by progressives, is almost indistinguishable from corporatism. Those who want to rewrite history to fit their modern-day political agenda ironically end up siding with the oppressors. In effect, they are criticizing themselves. From 1619 and beyond, there has been an ongoing struggle between those who want to consolidate power, to control and oppress, and those individuals who defend liberty at all costs. In the end, the Tappan brothers were vindicated. Using their entrepreneurial spirit, they created a workaround system to deal with the racist attacks against them. They invented the private credit score system and incorporated it into their new business model. They successfully recovered their wealth and continued to fund and lead the fight to end slavery. You can't separate personal freedom from economic freedom. It's an all or nothing thing. Those who practice the philosophy of freedom, like the Tappan brothers, have always been the true champions of freedom.